for anyone just coming in. Oh, there we go. That was a quick one. So uh, hello and welcome to the Scurf community call. Today is Thursday, May 19th. Uh, today we are going to be getting into a little bit about peer review. Uh, happy to answer some elements about the process and where we're at with it. We can also have a bit of a general discussion on peer review as we have had in the past at some points. Uh, I do want to take a little bit of time uh, to provide some updates on the podcast because we're kind of going into a planning uh, and strategizing time with the podcast. We're not actually going to be releasing anything until probably at least mid-July. Um, and yeah, I'll also just remind for anyone uh, who is joining for the first time, please feel free to provide an intro uh, in the chat. Uh, and for anyone who's here, uh, yeah, just please remember to stay on mute. And if there's any uh, sounds coming through weirdly, I think, Peter, I think you might be off mute. Um, if you don't mind just hopping on mute to avoid the background noise filtering in. Otherwise, yeah, I'll just jump in and do so. Thank you there. Um, but yeah, so I guess let's start off talking with some elements related to open peer review, uh, because that's what we said we'd do. And even if I totally forgot to get the team prepared to do that, that does not give us a right to not do that now. So we'll do at least a little bit of that, uh, and we'll see where the conversation goes from there. Uh, Umar, are you wearing a D-side day shirt right now? Uh, I wish. Uh, That'd I be way cooler. I the top outline it's, of it. I got excited that it might have been the this is, we this got is a, out in a while. gold shirt from Hot Topic. Well, that's fun. Let's so, summon demons. Yeah. So um, summon demons. That is a fun one. Uh, and Hot Topic, what a throwback. Uh, but coming back to uh, DSI related activities, and I'll just quickly mention in case anyone here is based in Berlin or happens to be traveling to Berlin early next week, there is a whole DSI conference happening in Berlin uh, Monday, Tuesday next week. Uh, that I know the Molecule, VitaDAO, LabDAO, SciDAO crews are kind of leading the organization of that. Um, I see Nick is hopping in. Uh, yeah, Umar, do you mind responding to Nick's message in Discord and just send him the right link? Uh, and yeah, apologies for anyone who did go to the, to the wrong meets uh, link. Uh, my apologies. We sorted that out for the future. But yeah, so to, to take a quick kind of recap of where we're at with the Open Peer Review Project, uh, I figure we can just kind of give the community an update of where some things are at. I think it was around two or three weeks ago, time is a blur, but a couple of weeks ago, uh, Nick and Umar presented on the process and kind of where we're at. So if anyone wants us to sort of zoom into any elements of the process, we're happy to. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of more nuanced conversation. I know we've already gotten into the, the elements of anonymity uh, and uh, some other kind of very nuanced discussions that uh, are just going to be realistically beyond what we're going for in the first iteration of the peer review experiment. Uh, and that's fine because this is meant to kick off a long road of experimentation, not meant to uh, sort of try defining what is the perfect peer review process. Uh, we're much more thinking about it in terms of what is the minimum viable peer review process for someone who is not pushing to a conference or to a publication uh, to get some kind of review on their research output so that they can feel confident that it got some form of review, right? Because what is the point of open peer or what is the point of peer review in general? It's attached to conferences or publications as their form of kind of editorial quality check to make sure that whatever gets presented in their mediums, considering that they are officially publishers with the structures that they run, that they can stand behind the information that's there. Uh, and to look at it more objectively in the scope of kind of why does science need peer review, uh, right? We all need sanity checks on our work. We have our blinders on, we have our biases, we all uh, are humans, which means we are all inevitably flawed creatures. Uh, and so it is always helpful to have structures around us that uh, you know we can have someone review and double check our work. And so the logic of how we started our, our thinking about the open peer review project was how do we provide the benefits of open peer review, but to someone not pushing to a conference, someone not pushing to a specific journal. Uh, and we're only going to be picking about three artifacts. Uh, I know I need to reach out to uh, the three folks who we've earmarked as the potential recipients 
of having their research outputs go through our first open peer review experiment. I need to finalize with them. We're also at the process of once we finalize who will actually be getting their work reviewed, we will curate potential reviewers per those research outputs. Uh, so I'm hoping where are we at today is the 19th. So I'm, I'm still kind of hoping that by the first, no later than second week of June, we can formally kick this off where reviewers know who's reviewing their work, or reviewers know, know whose work they're reviewing, uh, and uh, they can start the official review process, uh, which will take a couple of weeks. Uh, and then as soon as that process is done, we immediately kick in to review our peer review process. How did the experiment go? What can we improve? Let's get feedback from the people whose work got reviewed. Let's get feedback from the people who did the reviewing. We'll definitely present on one of these community calls in the future. Uh, we also are collaborating with a variety of folks deep in the peer review space, whether they're building their own projects or products around it, uh, or just meta researchers as well. Uh, and we'll get some targeted feedback from folks like that. But that's kind of at the at the high level of how we're hoping the next two or so months go. Uh, and as soon as we're ready to, then we'll start a V2 uh, where we will probably get uh, into a little more detail about some of our design decisions and really start experimenting. Uh, because as I was saying, kind of our goal is to see what is this minimum viable peer review process that we can provide to independent peer reviewers. And simultaneously, as we're running through that first iteration, uh, at the same time, we want to be looking at what is the actual landscape of design decisions that we can kind of tweak variables around to change peer review processes. Uh, and how does that actually look like in terms of existing research knowledge? So that's you know putting together a bit of an open repo of hey, here's research on open peer review, and here's a you know a, a kind of here's a, a good list of resources to work through and whatnot. Those are going to be things we definitely want to put together this summer. Um, and yeah, we're going to be excited because I know. Uh, the Adams uh, crew is currently working on a paper that they want to kind of overview the history of peer review and how we got to where we are. And I know we'll definitely want to engage with that team to see how we can collaborate and contribute some more open knowledge around that. Uh, I know the DSI Labs, DSI Foundation crew, they also want to get some experimentation around open peer review off the ground. Uh, and there is a DSI event. Uh, I don't think anything has been formalized, so I'll leave it a little vague. Uh, but there is a DSI event later this year that is slowly coming together uh, that the organizers of that event are actually reaching out to. I'm forgetting which, but it's one of the major meta science, meta research conferences uh, that that conference got canceled for this year because of COVID. And so we're seeing uh, if this crew of DSI folks can actually take over the mantle for a year and run a meta research conference in which we will add some programming specifically around the intersection of Web3 and meta research. Because I think working more with these meta science, meta research communities is very important so that we don't reinvent the wheel on peer review, uh, considering that's kind of right, like that feedback loop is exactly what we're trying to do uh, and have people avoid of just doing the same thing that's been done somewhere else. Uh, that's what we as SCURF are trying to do overall for Web3 research. So we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're focusing on doing, uh, creating that kind of structure for ourselves around the open peer review experiment as well. So that's kind of a general preamble on it. I'll pause there in case anyone has any high level questions. Uh, and then maybe Umar and I can walk through or just give some more updates of where things stand, where uh, kind of what is our actual concrete plan in the next week or two around this. Uh, and from there, we'll see if anyone wants to just, you know, theoretically talk about peer review or any abstract components of it or any specific elements of our process. So yeah, I will pause there and add some necessary silence. So it sounds like no questions just yet. So maybe Umar and I can provide some. Oh, Chris, please. Yeah, I guess um, one of the things that I'm trying to understand about open peer review is it an attempt to take away the notion that the peer review process decides what becomes uh, published at that level in that um if there's 10 peer reviewers only what those peer reviewers have access to ends up published whereas open peer review sort of opens up the capacity for uh 
those people not to be deciding what actually makes it to publication because that's where i'm like is is that one of the main goals because i'm not i haven't heard it necessarily articulated but um I, i'm just wondering is that part of it so the way i personally see it uh and i'll just comment a little bit before handing it off to rich but I, the way i'm personally viewing it is that my own view on this is that I think review and publication should be disambiguated because I think the way that it currently exists where they're attached, and again, this could just be one very narrow critical view, but I, I think that mainly exists for liability reasons, right? Like they are publishing venues, they need to do some review to make sure they don't get sued for whatever they put out there. Um, but I think from a the at more abstract thinking of how do we maximize the quality outputs that exist in the world and then secondarily how do we make sure those outputs find it to the people who need to hear that given the things that they're working on um for that first part of how do we just maximize the quality of outputs i do think there just needs to be an opportunity for anyone who is producing some kind of focused research output to have a community or a formal structure that they could reach out to and say hey i want to make my thing better Right, like I, I keep saying the example of like, imagine Vitalik in 2013, 2014 was like, hey, I'm thinking of the smart contract based uh, protocol layer uh, instead of just Bitcoin. What if he had more people to turn to than the 20 or so folks that ended up being the, the co-founders of Ethereum, right? Uh, and especially if anyone's far, followed like, Laura Shin's book on that or any of the other uh, kind of personal and historical elements of how it came out, uh, it seems very clear in retrospect that he could have really used some folks to bad ideas against who were not financially incentivized to build the system with him. So that's kind of my own uh, inspiration and thinking of how do we just provide, especially given how much of Web3 does not come out of academia, how do we provide that kind of benefit to folks uh, like that who are building these next protocols and projects that you know potentially millions of people around the planet will use and also knowing the realities of Web3 probably gets minimal actual oversight and review of any formal kind before it gets pushed out. So I don't see this as conflated with say quality assurance on code audit. Like I understand that there's a big difference between there, but I also think adding this earlier stage open peer review is a necessary step for us to better understand what are all the resources around review that could or potentially should exist to maximize the quality outputs that happen uh, and to minimize the amount of kind of questionable research that actually makes it out there. So that's a bit more of my personal view than an institutional one. I think we have a long road of just experimenting to see how can we do some bare minimum stuff here. Um, but yeah, that that's just kind of my view on it. And I'll, I'll pass it off to, to Rich to, ju uh, to jump in. Thanks, Eugene. You touched on some of the things that I was going to say, and so I took my hand down briefly, but then I thought of other things, so thanks. Um, I want to also start off with uh, Eugene's disclaimer too, that I'm personally intensely interested in the notion of open peer review. So I have a lot of things that I'm bringing to the table and these aren't necessarily organizational or scurvy things too. So as Eugene said, this is an experiment. Let's see what works and what doesn't work. Um, but here's some of my stuff, my baggage. Um, it's easy to come into the open or the peer review uh, space and say, all right, well, here's all of the uh, pet peeves, here's all the bad actors, potentially, here's all the problems, and here's all the things. And it's pretty easy to get manifesto at that point. Um, I want to try to caution us away from that kind of activity. So we're not here to, um, well, anyways, I'm, if I list off the things, then I'm doing, I'm part of the problem. So I'm not going to list off the things. So um, peer review is a valuable service. Um, we're dealing with a whole uh, ecosystem full of academics or research, well, I should say academics, but researchers and thinkers and computer scientists and uh, enthusiastic uh, experimenters that may not have access to peer review or may not even have an experience of what peer review might mean. Um, we have a large demographic of academic actors that are interested in becoming involved, uh, more involved with the crypto space. And so, um, it, it's been a rocky road getting here, but uh, crypto has some legitimacy and there's interesting experiments to be uh, had here. So how do we uh, create more access? And while we're creating more access to a, a type of service that people might, might not be familiar with, how do we make sure that we're adding uh, a little bit of a crypto spin on this? Let's make it open. Let's make it uh, transparent. Let's figure out if maybe there's an incentive to be aligned here and there. And then let's offer um, this utility to individuals that may not have had it before. So um, we're not you know, kicking down. I, I use this 
the image is so pleasing to me. I use it a lot, but we're not kicking down the or doors of academe, you know, and tossing Molotovs and saying, don't worry, crypto is here. We're going to save you. It's, it's a completely different model. We want to figure out what academia is doing well, uh, figure out um, what some of the requirements are in our own space, merge those things together, perform some experiments out in the open, uh, align some incentives, um, use some of this excitement and enthusiasm we have around collaboration in the DAO space. And oh, anyways, I can go on and on and on. There's lots of really cool things happening here. So this is an opportunity for us to perform experiments, not you know burn the publishers to the ground and then dance on the ashes of it. Right? So that's one of the things that I'm, I'd like to remind people, or at least throw it there as a suggestion. Yeah, and I'll just quickly add before passing it off to Mohammed that um, I also think that in general, the question of how can we support open peer review, at least in my mind, very much uh, pairs well with our core mission here at SCURF of advancing Web3 research. And especially as we try to not just work uh, with academics, but with anyone producing high quality research outputs or interesting things that are like it or not getting implemented, how can we provide mechanisms of them having a review, even if they don't want to go through the SCURF forum, right? Because then if it's they post on our forum, et cetera, we are trying to add some versions of feedback and editorial or content-based review. Um, but that's not the same as like, hey, I'm an expert in your domain area. Let me actually give you some concrete feedback on your idea. And so I think at least taking a, a baby step in that direction via this experimentation can provide useful inputs for us, both about how should SCURF you know, formalize its informal review into a proper peer review process over time if we deem that to be the appropriate thing, or we could decide that's not the appropriate thing, but we just built this amazing network of brilliant people, and then we can invite all of them to help us out with other SCURF things where their deep expertise is needed. So I, I see a very high probability of uh, whatever we're doing pairing very, very nicely with our core mission. Uh, and quite candidly, I feel like if it didn't feel that way, we we probably would be questioning much more whether or not this is worth the operational overhead that it's in there we're going to take that's a great point it's, it's scratching a niche for us all so we, we produce the summaries we produce content here aggressively um reviewing that and figuring out how to open that process up and learn from it is critically important to our success we're also becoming more and more engaged with um we, we find interesting research um that's seeking funding and we can help out with that um, how do we ensure that we're contributing in a way that provides real value and yeah. so we need to adopt some of these really intelligent and really cool processes that already exist and have existed in academia for you know a thousand years um but also it's a good opportunity for us to look at it with some fresh eyes and see if there's something that we can tweak here and there so that's the that's the perspective i like to take mohammed do you want to jump in yes thank you um so there was a um or maybe it was Eugene, uh, about when uh, Mr. Buterin was uh, coming up with uh, Ethereum and needing people who were involved who were not uh, financially motivated. Uh, there is a financial motiv motivation in academia for publishing. And indeed, I mean, we are putting ideas out there, but um, the space is, is so radically uh, altered from what it was in 2014 or any other period VCs are quitting their firms and starting Web3 startups. It, so um, there's a financial incentive element here that's possibly a little bit different from uh, a biologist who's writing about a new kind of uh, behavior in aardvarks or something. Um, so my question is, uh, I, I, and I, I don't really know exactly how we deal with this, but in terms of like terms, I guess, uh, it, it is, has, has thought been given to how, how that, how that difference that we have in this web three space versus a traditional publication space, because I mean, there's, there's just, there's just so much potential money involved, uh, yeah. in it. And normally when people publish that they're publishing because they want tenure or because, uh, there's some commercialization aspect, but, I don't know, something about this feels a little bit weird because we're, the person's writing about a protocol or something that's directly related to an investment opportunity in some cases. And that is, I mean, that's, that's, uh, uh, it's been argued in some cases, SEC territory. So I'm curious about, about how we deal with that. 
Yeah, so that's that's a very interesting point. And this is one where I personally want to better understand of where do lines get drawn around more and more technical research? Because at a certain point, once you're right, like, let's just step out of Web3 for a moment, you could be writing about a cutting edge uh, artificial intelligence, neural net machine, you know, whatever kind of system that you're building. And you could be writing that because you're also building the startup around that thing. And I, I know plenty of academics who are releasing papers with their academic hat on and working on the private thing uh, on the side as well. So I, it only adds even more complexity into my mind when A, the literal technology, right, at least for anyone doing protocol layer research, like that thing is commercializable and open sourced and anyone can just read the paper and be like, ooh, I'm just going to save a Google reminder and then buy into it as soon as it comes out. And like the, it, it adds a whole other dimension of it beyond just say uh, traditional uh, CS or at least like cutting edge sexy CS topics that, uh, you know, like VR, AR, autonomous vehicles, uh, drones, like all these areas are, are very hot and getting a tremendous amount of activity in their own right. Um, and I just remember from my time working at Carnegie Mellon University coming here, those lines did not feel fully clear at every time in terms of like who is funding research and who is receiving the funding and what else they were building in addition to that. Um, so I, I don't want to just wash our hands clean and be like, ah, it's complicated. No one has solved it. So why do we have to? I don't, I don't want to pretend that that's the approach that I, I'm uh, championing from our perspective here. Uh, and I would even say, like, we're complicating it even further because we are directly compensating the reviewers, right? We're not just saying, like, hey, do this because you're passionate about the thing, but we'll give you 500 bucks to review it. Uh, and whether or not that amount is a useful one or will only distract or totally change the incentive landscape and attract a fully different audience than what would have been attracted if it was purely based on reputational incentives and non-financial incentives. Um, but at the core of, at least what I'm hearing, at the core of your question is the idea that what is the full landscape of incentivization that needs to be present for the highest quality review to take place? And simultaneously, what are the cases where that can go horribly wrong in terms of, you know, even potentially violating SEC or other territory because you're effectively giving cloaked investment advice in the guise of like, well, look how cool my new tool is. Uh, and I don't have answers for those things yet. I just know for the quality assurance that we're putting in on picking research, right? We're talking about, uh, at least initially, we're thinking uh, governance because those are the researchers that we've funded so far. They happen to be more focused on governance. And so that feels slightly less pertinent because it's the thing that is being reviewed is a framework or a concept, not an actual like implementable uh, core basis that is immediately monetizable. But yeah, especially if we get to like reviewing new L1 research, like that is a much more pertinent topic. So uh, yeah, I don't mean to just give a runaround. I don't have a good answer for this yet. And I think we should, I, I appreciate you bringing it up because I think it's an interesting point of discussion uh, and would love to hear thoughts. And I see there's already a queue of folks, so I'll, I'll stop rambling, but we'd love to hear others thoughts. So Chris, you're up first. Yeah, I think one of the, I, I don't know if this is fundamentally trying to approach true objectivity, if that's like the core, or if that's like at the core of the open peer review approach. But what I'm starting to glean out of this is like, one of the perceived problems with research is we don't necessarily know who's funding the research. And then when we do know who's funding the research, and then implicitly creates a bias towards who funded that research, whether the researcher uh, actually modified the research for that funder or not. Um, so is it bringing transparency to where the funds are coming from in order to make the process more objective by proxy of ensuring that it's always clear from where funds are coming to pay the reviewers because then i think that's like i don't know if it's possible to ever be 100 percent objective but if all of the subjectivity is transparent then that seems to be as close as we can possibly get to a truly objective review and that's where i'm like is if that is seemingly the goal that makes more sense to me as someone who participates in the peer review process behind academic doors because then when i like look at vitalik had access to people but it was behind a paywall so that's where i'm like the only time people could come and contribute uh feedback to him is if they were willing to pay 200 dollars to do so so there was like a paywall put up 
it wasn't that Vitalik didn't have access. He also left academia. So there's like all these things about if someone is in a position where they need access to review, like, is it just completely in a vacuum? Because I think that's where there's always going to be money coming from somewhere. So is the goal to make it seem as if the money is in a vacuum or if it's completely transparent? Because I think those are two different ends. Um, those are all good questions. And I think that the, ultimately those are the questions we want to answer, right? Um, and it's, the, the, I said that I'm deeply passionate about this project and here's one of the reasons, and this is what I'm bringing to the table again. So I don't let this call everybody else's opinions, but um, when you're looking at a system where people are producing or doing a lot of work um, for no clear benefit or for a very long and ambiguous long-tailed benefit at some point in the future, um that, may, that generally makes me nervous uh, I, I find that when you're looking at a system uh it's always uh fun to ask yourself at some point who benefits from the system if there's no clear benefit then um frequently occasionally i guess you're the benefit <laughs> you may not realize that yet or uh there might be benefits out there um the farther out they are the less um you can actually bank on those things anyways i'm going down a bit of a rabbit hole here so um Part of this, the thing that I like about this is that there's an experiment. Um, and that experiment is if there's clear incentives and if there's clear value, reciprocal value being created, um, and if there's a transparency on the way that the process is being handled and who the actors are in that process and their decision making during steps of that process, then there's a tremendous amount of sunlight has just been uh, uh, just landed on a, on a generally it's kind of an opaque um gated process previously and so uh if uh you know we don't all magically discover the solutions to all these things right out of the gate what we will have though is uh, a bunch of data that can be used to figure these things out in the future for the next iteration so um what does it look like if the uh, pool of reviewers is uh, a known quantity and they're um uh conflicts are also known as well and what if the reviews that they make are uh, auditable and can be uh inventoried and people can begin to look for trends through different viewers or different types of papers or um and map those and researchers can come in and ask all kinds of really interesting questions and graph you know oh, interesting correlation over here those things can, can come out of this process um we can also um begin to uh attract or, or find out whether uh, quality of actors is increased or decreased based on these things. And where is the value in the system? So is it possible to create uh, a workforce of reviewers um, that you know, has reputational advantage, has financial advantage, has a career advantage, uh, long tail, as opposed to what, I, and this is me personally having offering an opinion again, but um, this sort of suspicious notion as a non-academic where you're doing things for the good of uh, science, and that's why you're doing all this stuff. Hmm. I like the idea. In practice, though, um, that makes me a little suspicious because if somebody's getting direct benefit, the people that are providing it may or may not see some benefit in the future. That makes me nervous. Um, so I don't know. Uh, anyways, uh, I keep my suspicions and my concerns and my uh, uh, worldview to myself. Uh, as much as possible, except when I leak them out in these very public community calls. Uh, but what I think that the the great uh, the great output here is that we can go well. Hey, let's get the actors involved. Let's get the reviewers. Let's get the, the publishers. Let's get the authors. Let's get the uh, grantors. Let's get the community together, and let's talk about these things together. And then let's try a couple of things, and then see what happens. And so we can do uh, a little open peer review on our open peer review process as we're open peer reviewing and then uh, start gathering some data and seeing whether somebody else wants to uh, answer some of these questions that we might have. Sorry, that's it for me. Mark? Um, wanted to jump in on the transparency discussion uh, because I'm, uh, very bullish on like what is possible if everyone knows what's going on behind the scenes if there is no behind the scenes and everything's just on stage um 
especially like Chris and Rich both mentioned, like just like knowing if someone has a subjective reason that could bias their research, having that out in the open. And I think there's like multiple aspects to that. In addition to the financial ones of like who's funding your research, there's also these subjective biases that researchers will have about like, this is, you know, my theory and the research I'm reviewing opposes my theory. So I'm going to review it more negatively. And that kind of stuff comes up a lot in like the peer review literature um, when they review subjective biases. Um, one thing that I think could be really interesting to experiment with there is asking reviewers to declare their biases up front, their conflicts of interest, um, and not just the ones that they're used to revealing about like who's uh, uh, who's funding me. And even that, I don't I don't think they're necessarily like fully. Uh, disclosed about, but also like um, I'm reviewing this research and it opposes my research or it opposes the research of someone I closely collaborate with. And that should also be out in the open. Um, I think, you know, like when we think about like those networks of decentralized research and there's different layers to them, like financial, intellectual, social, uh, there's also like those layers to um, the researcher, the reviewer, the person themselves as a node uh, in a network having a financial bias, a social bias, an intellectual bias uh, that all could be sort of out in the open. Um, and I wanted to also jump in on the question about publication. Um, I really love the shift towards preprints. And I think preprints have been somewhat successful at disrupting the publication model because um, in at least in CS and AI, that's like one of the primary venues for publication besides conferences. And uh, publication, I feel like, is increasingly shifting to uh, a type of thing where it's not like, is your research published or not published? Um, because now it's sort of just like, is it online or not online instead? And you can put it online whenever you want. But instead, the publication is almost more like a stamp or a status, like a seal of this is blue ribbon quality research um, because it's been like, you know, gone through res uh, gone through nature. And then there's sort of this question of like, can we stand up or can, can anyone stand up other organizations which are able to put ribbons on papers that have been put online as preprints and say, this meets my standard of quality. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested to see if something like that could work too. Yeah, oh, I was going to speak to your first point, but the second point is interesting too. So the coupling and or decoupling of uh, the peer review from the publication process, I think is there's fantastic things to be understood there as well, which um, I'm not qualified to comment on, but I'm looking forward to watching. Um, the first point that you made though about conflict of interest. So the, um, there's two problems, there's two sides of that coin. So saying, well, this is a great paper, but I, I can't talk about it because I'm involved too deeply with the space for one reason or another. Um, on the surface, sure, that sounds great. Okay, well, I guess I've lost you as a resource, but what if you just declared that you had that conflict and that conflict was clearly stated and the reasons behind that conflict and then the, the author decided, you know what? Sure, go ahead. Like, I understand what your conflict is. I'll use that as a lens to view what your review is all about. And so that can actually be uh, a reputational and quality advantage. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of interesting things that get turned on their heads once the these things become out in the open. So imagine we had a pool of reviewers. Those reviewers had um, uh, sort of their CV. Uh, the reviewer's CV was out there, and somebody published had a paper that they wanted to have reviewed. Um, and there's some kind of a mixing and matching process between uh, reviewers and papers and uh, and authors. Um, there is a a lot of variables at play here, but there's some interesting results that can can shake out of this. So like, yeah, I do you know what I do. I want that professor. I, I don't. I, I understand that there there's an appearance of the conflict, but uh, the thing that they're going to say, their review is going to be open. Their conflict has been uh, noted, and uh, I've accepted them as a reviewer, or I've encouraged them to help me with this review. With that level of transparency and openness, uh, it's up for people to make their own judgments about whether that person has been disqualified or not. So things, um, anyway, so yeah, I, I, I think that there's a certain amount of, I feel like I'm being naive a bit, but um, when it comes to this, this the benefits of openness, but I think that there's things to be learned, right? So maybe we find out that conflict in some situations can actually be a reputational or a, 
an intellectual advantage if people are, are you know policing themselves visibly and in the open. So anyways, I just want to throw that out there. Rich, vote it. Uh, I'd say that this issue of bias and conflict of interest is a very complex topic that is not treated as such, not even close. Uh, because it is not only about what um, financial interests are behind you um, or what uh, maybe what f um, people are you associated with. Uh, I mean, in because of my very idiosyncratic backgrounds in history of science and cognitive science, I can I am very well aware that bias exists in so many dimensions and it is very hard for researchers to be self-aware enough to actually state it out loud or uh, even in a more collective sense to just be out there it is very hard to uh, go uh, deep and um <laughs> like paint and uh bring the biases to the surface uh th there's bias in worldview there's so many scientists that have been motivated uh, by even philosoph very philosophical issues. For example, there's the history of Charles Sanders Peirce, the logician and semiotician who has had trouble uh, having a um, university position all his life because he had such a um, radical theory uh, in in terms of uh, human action is a pragmatism that and all his peers were just against him and despite his uh clarity of thought and uh, despite how uh great his work was he never got to have uh, a position there because of biases of worldview of uh, philosophical uh, um, disagreements and we should take all of these aspects more uh, carefully, I think, now that we're thinking of these issues of open peer review and bias and all the ways that it can manifest. Yeah, thanks, Fotis. I think it's, uh, yeah, it is important to think about kind of uh, known and recognized biases uh, versus uh, ones that will never be known by the individual person. And, you know, I, I will only be able to disclose the things that I'm aware of. I can't disclose the things I don't realize I'm biased about. Uh, and at least having the clear of like, hey, if I'm working with Umar or I'm getting paid on a project that Umar is funding, I should probably not be reviewing Umar's work. And like, how can we at least uh, like again create that minimum viable of like uh, even if it's not biases per se but just any other connections or commitments that everyone publicly should be aware of to make sure things are above board uh but then yeah as as you take gradients into the deeper bias territory it becomes fuzzier and fuzzier of how you actually sort that and capture that systematically uh but yeah chris please yeah if if someone has never public published before they wouldn't necessarily understand but there's like a really rigorous process in, in place for people to assert their biases, all of the funding. Um, and that's kind of like, that's already in place for peer review. So the idea that it's not being treated seriously, like if you've never published, it may appear that way, but you really have to assert your biases in a way that when it goes through the IRB or an institution like university review, they're going to check you on this. It's not just, you put the publication out there and you don't get to uh like nobody checks your identity or where you came from you literally have to give the background of why you started the study what your history is as an individual uh like who's funding the study if there, if there is funding there's all these things in place about uh the review process that if you've never actually published you might not know and it might not appear that they're there but there is a very rigorous process for determining bias in place. Chris Paul? Yeah, I was, uh, kind of adding to that a little bit. Um, like, so there is this process. I think, you know, it probably could be more, I think some of the, the interest in this is the transparency of that rigorous process, right? So there is that, um, it is not always perfect, it is all, always perfect, but there is some like, where are these clear and obvious um, reputational 
or not reputational, but these bias problems. But what I am maybe even more interested in is uh, to Fotis's point, uh, where that does occasionally happen, where there is a misalignment between the status quo and cut a person's knowledge set. Um, I think that there is a strong belief that that is the that that actually is the more normal normative thing that happens, and I think that is incredibly rare. And I'm very interested in a open peer review and transparent peer review process, because I think a lot of people believe that there's like secret hidden knowledge that status quo is keeping from getting to the surface. And an open peer review would more likely, I suspect, reveal that kind of that lone voice is more often incorrect. Like to me, peer, rev peer review is great because I come from this Karl Popper perspective of like, let's eliminate the stuff that doesn't work. And I really like process of elimination like to the to me that's more what peer review like showing that off um i think would be great yeah thank you paul fotis i like to reply to to you chris about it uh, yeah of course uh saying that it is not uh, ser taken seriously doesn't mean that it's not rigorous my point is that it is not deep enough it is superficial assembly. It is very rigorous about some issues that do not affect research uh, as much, I'd say. I'm I'm sure I I'm sure we can argue about like the subjectivity of what where it's superficial, but like having gone through that process recently, it's it's like a lot more in depth about a person's biases than one might think or or like for example my my experiences in developing in the blockchain space are something i have to include in my biases so it's like if someone's reading my research they're going to know that i've developed projects in the bi in the blockchain space because i have to put that in my uh like bias section Um, I'm super curious about like uh, what all is in the bias section that they ask. The financial stuff seems straightforward, like who's funding you. Uh, I'm curious also about the other stuff you mentioned, like that they that you have to reveal that you work in blockchain and other um, maybe like social, reputational, or intellectual biases that they ask you to reveal. Um, if you're able to. Could you share the um, form or um, documentation that they request? Uh, just like, you know, what their request is, like maybe after the call or uh, via email or anything? Because I think that'd be interesting. Uh, to oh, look for at. sure. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where, um, like, having had to submit to IRB within the last, like, six months, knowing the things that got rejected and then the things they were asking me for i see like when they're asking why i'm doing the study um what is motivating the the impetus for me even starting the study and then it's like you have to explain with the literature review why this study is then valid so it's like it's connecting your bias to your research on the space so that's where like when I look at the things that they required of me to explain why I'm doing the study and then to then prove the data to validate the logic behind that, it's very much taking your historical bias and connecting it to the thesis or the hypothesis in the actual study as to why this person is actually qualified to do this study. You know, on one hand, I also think that you know Chris is uh, speaking much more about the production of that research. So uh, if I was going to do the research, I go uh, through that IRB process. Uh, reviewers do not necessarily do that exact same thing. Um, there are some biases, but at least most of the reviews that I have experienced is you know this is double double blind. And while that is maybe not the world's perfect system, um, for getting rid of biases, right? Because uh, especially for smaller or more um, emerging fields where I was like, oh, I know this person because I know exactly how they write. Uh, there is something to it. I don't know who's reviewing me. 
and the reviewer doesn't know who is telling them stuff back, right? So you just find out reviewer one liked that you did this, but didn't like that you did this. Um, I do think that there is some value um, to kind of this blind system. I do wonder if there's a way in an open peer review system that you can kind of capture the best of both in some ways. Yeah, and I think it's, I'll just quickly add one thing before handing off to you, Omar. Thank you there, Paul. Uh, I think it's also interesting to think about, right, because I feel like we, we can get lost in the pure philosophical meta level discussions on what could, should, et cetera. And, you know, that that, that uh, dangerously gets us to speculative uh, and non-concrete territory. That was very fun and interesting in its own right. On the very opposite end of the spectrum is like, well, let's just start doing and who cares? And, you know, we'll, we'll figure other things out later. Uh, and I definitely am not a fan of move fast and break things when it comes to uh, knowledge bases and things upon which other things will be built. Uh, and so thinking about sort of, well, wh where is the golden middle for us as an organization in slowly figuring these questions out? Because I think there have been so many great questions, problems, challenges brought up. And if we try to solve all of these, we're probably not going to launch any version of an open peer review experiment uh, in the next six to 12 months, if ever, because of people who have been working on this for decades haven't solved these problems in very concrete environments. And so it's also interesting to think of what is the simultaneous process that we can create of bare minimum experimentation. Uh, and I saw Jean had posted also a, a comment about, you know, depending on the specifics of the reviewers and absolutely right. We are starting with an immensely highly curated hand selected thing that is absolutely in no way, shape or form scalable. We get that. But our hope is that that at least provides us some beginnings that we can start picking apart and understanding what are we actually doing, what's going well and what isn't with this starting point, while simultaneously going to the much wider range of, hey, well, what are all the variables that we can work on? And you know, for transparency, maybe it makes sense for us to coordinate conversations across a few meta conferences, meta research conferences to be like, hey, what's actually the best? Uh, what's the, what's been experimented on with this in the last six to nine months that might not be in academic outputs yet that we don't know about yet? And how do we have these live discussions or how do we incentivize people to come collaborate and give us their opinions? And right, there's all kinds of different uh, levers that we can potentially pull as we go from this bare minimum, give a review to three people who didn't have a chance at getting a review to whatever the future state of this is. Uh, and partially, Chris, when you asked the question earlier of kind of the, the vision and how this fits into uh, like supporting our own reviewer or, or review externally and uh, or separating out the, the publication and conference from the reviewing, right? Part of why I'm hesitant to actually give like an organizational view on this is because I'm highly confident that whatever the end result will be, at least I, I don't want to speak on anyone else's behalf, I'm guessing I will not have envisioned prior just because we're going to need to experiment and play around and learn from a ton of people to fill in all of our blind spots. And then we'll hopefully get to that end point of like, oh, wow, well, this is actually the process that we can roll out. Um, and I know we haven't really dug too deep into the actual compensation mechanism of it, but right, like that's its own huge question of like, how do you pay people for this? And is it better to have a per review thing? Is it better to have an hourly rate? Is it better to have an annual fellowship with a, an approximate expectation? And for different personality types, right, those three might be might work well for different types of people. And so how do we figure out how to accommodate all of these very challenging and erudite questions? Thank you all again for bringing them up. Uh, and how do we also come to terms with like, well, some questions are too big for us to solve independently. How do we convene the right discussions around them? Versus on the other hand, how do we actually concretely experiment and focus on things to improve and potentially feed data back to researchers? And one of the reasons I'm so excited to collaborate with meta researchers is for them to give us feedback on like, hey, if you tweak these three, three, three things, or if you put your outputs in this format, I can immediately go research it as someone who's been doing research on peer review for decades, right? And like we want to make sure we're teeing them up so we can get as much uh, unbiased uh, as possible opinions on our processes. Because also like if we're just paying someone to consult us, that's going to be different than like, hey, here's an open data set on a thousand peer reviews that we did over the last year and a half. Have fun researchers. Like you go tell us what you find. Uh, and like that's also would be really powerful and interesting but uh, given that we're starting with three and that is a tiny N, we're also not rushing to that. We're, we're trying to kind of balance all of these moving parts together, which is challenging in its own right. But I rambled on enough there. Umar, please. Uh, 
like like uh, Eugene pointed out, there's so much research that's already been done into like peer review. I think one of the really interesting and fun parts of this project for me has been digging into that literature. Um, one of the super interesting pieces that we looked at um, by Professor Nihar Shah um, had this quote that said, asking reviewers to consent to their identities being released did not affect the quality of the reviews or the overall acceptance recommendation, but a significantly higher fraction of reviewers declined to review. Um, so uh, that to me is super interesting because it sort of uh, provides some motivation to say reviewers should be public. Um, and you know, we were we were going back and forth for a little while on whether we wanted to do a single a single blind versus a a, a transparent system. And uh, you know, like pushing the envelope all the way towards the transparent system to start with is to me uh, really interesting because there as far as i can tell although being single blind or double blind can prevent some biases the fact that it doesn't affect review quality um indicates that maybe those biases are already being accounted for in some other way um and i think it'll be interesting to sort of experiment um with what those biases are uh and also, like, you know, there is this dream state where um, a lot of these biases by just being out in the open, like we said, can get accounted for because we're aware of them. Like, maybe we can't eliminate biases. Maybe the best thing we can do is just have that light sh shined on them so that we're aware of them. Uh, and then Eugene also brought up, uh, I think, one of the biggest questions we have in this process of, like, how are we going to financially incentivize all of this? So I wanted to share that. Uh, right now, we're actually working on a forum post to post on uh, our forum, uh, Scurf, Scurfy Scurf, and uh, get some feedback um, specifically around the financial incentives. Uh, so I will just share my screen really quick and maybe uh, show a little preview. Um, not this one, not this one, too many documents open. Uh, so uh, this is something we're going to post on the forum to really just get some feedback. Um, and we're sort of outlining a few different systems for financial incentives. Uh, as I think uh, we mentioned, I, the the one we're likely going to use on the first iteration of this experiment is sort of very simple, just a bounty for conducting the review. Um, but the, in which if you complete the review, you get paid this flat fee. There's also some other things we could experiment with, like a competitive bounty in which multiple people submit, but not all of them get paid out. Instead, you could select the top reviews and what's nice about this is that it sort of flips the paradigm of us recruiting reviewers to to complete the review to reviewers finding the bounty and then choosing to do it and opens up the pool of reviewers to a larger community to participate in and from there hopefully people we maybe wouldn't have thought to to recruit um but are very knowledgeable would sort of come in and have the best reviews um, there's also uh, fellowships, uh, which is like rather than paying for the review, paying for some period of time uh, in which maybe um, multiple reviews happen. And um, another idea which I like is coordinate circles in which review maybe happens as a community uh, of people, a group of people working together to review a paper. And then the individuals in that group uh, assign points to the others in the group based on how much they think they contributed and then they split a shared pool of money based on the amount of points each individual earned um and so these are these are pretty experimental and i think it'll be exciting to sort of play around with these and see which of them work which of them don't work i'm i'm hopeful that that this community moving towards communities of review is something that we can uniquely do because of um the internet and online communities coming together um and one system that we haven't gone into a lot of detail yet here but and that's mainly because you need to do more research about how it would work is something that does like either a prediction market or staking um, in which, as a reviewer, you would say, you know, I, bl I I will stake some amount of reputation tokens on this on this paper being of such and such quality, 
and then sort of seeing how that plays out over time, whether in a year or two years from now, um, that paper is agreed upon by the community to have that quality or not. And if you were right, then your prediction would be more valuable and perhaps earn you some, some additional tokens. Whereas if you were wrong, um, then you would not earn those tokens, you would maybe even lose them. So in some ways that sort of just quantifies a lot of what should already happen in the review system, which is if you're right more often, you should gain reputation. If you're wrong more often, you should lose reputation. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if we can sort of create a system that mirrors how a lot of uh, thinking already happens, but maybe isn't uh, formalized quantitatively. And so, so this post will be going up soon and uh, hoping to get, uh, hoping to continue the discussion uh, really and and dig into some of the nitty gritty details. Great, thank you, Umar. Uh, and yeah, so that uh, that is just about bringing us to time. So uh, thank you all for joining and for partaking in this conversation. As Umar mentioned, we're going to have the kind of meta post on this open peer review process uh, up on. Uh, yeah, I know, right? Uh, I'm expecting at some point to just see like a full tree getting brought through or something. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you all for joining and being part of the discussion. As mentioned, uh, Umar or Nick will be posting that meta post at some point in the next week or so. So please, please, please feel free to engage with that. We are also going to do some small breakouts with other teams who actively work on open peer review. So um, right now, the peer review project team are, are Nick, Umar, uh, Rich, and myself. If there is anyone else who wants to collaborate, contribute, or at least give thoughts and feedback, please feel free to flag that to me just so I remember to keep that in mind. But otherwise, we are now at time. So thank you all for spending part of your Thursday with us. And I hope you have a good rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Peace.